open discussion. So we have uh, Dr. Linus Mwinga. Dr. Mwinga, just confirm your presence and uh, greet the network. Dr. Mwinga. Right. We also have uh, Dr. Kozia Ziambo. I'm, I'm, this is Dr. Mwinga, Chair. I'm there. I'm, I'm around. Thank you so much, Doc. Right. So, Dr. Kozia Ziambo. And we also have uh, Madam Mary Chizuka, as well as Dr. Chelo Mwinga and um, Dr. Chishala Chabala. That's a panel of experts that we have today, and we will interact more with them uh, during the course of the, of the session today. So in the interest of time, I would like at this point to ask the didactic presenter to take us through the, the session for today. Just share the screen and we get into it. Okay. Don't know if my eyesight will be better or I change this where you're seated. Oh, it's fine. Apologies about that. So I think we're just making a swap. So like I uh, said earlier on, uh, my name is Kevin Zimba. I'm a, a program specialist for TB, uh, program specialist TB advisor for USAID Zambia. And there is no significant conflict to disclose uh, in this presentation. So I'll quickly start the presentation. Sorry. So today's objectives is one, I think we need to demystify the myth that childhood TB is, a, is difficult to diagnose, outline the difference between adult and childhood TB, outline the approach to making a diagnosis of TB in HIV infected and HIV uh, negative uh, children, and also look at the diagnostic tools that are available to make a diagnosis of TB. We will briefly look at uh, DRTB and TPT options for DSTB and uh, DRTB in children. I think we'll notice, like was uh, stated uh, by Dr. Singini, that uh, we have two cases. I think one case is about DRTB. One is a drug susceptible case that we have the, in, uh, as we go to our presentation. So before we start and go into the meat of the presentation, we'll go and have a, we'll have a poll question. Okay, we're able to share the poll question. Okay. Right. So poll question number one is saying uh, childhood TB. Uh, choose the best answer. Option A says, childhood TB is not a major public health concern. Childhood TB is not a major public health concern. B, childhood TB is difficult to diagnose all the time. C, childhood TB diagnosis requires a bit more effort. D, none of the above. So there you have it, network. Uh, you have... Uh, option to choose one answer out of those four options. And um, all those are in regards to childhood TB. So this is going to help us understand um, the knowledge gap in the majority of the participants, if there is any uh, regarding childhood TB. So I just allow the poll to run for a few more seconds because we're just below 50% or now we had 50% of the participants have participated. Uh, we are waiting for just one more person from uh, Kabwe General to respond, and also another person from Peter Singonko in Indola, and also someone in Litambia. Right. So we'll end the poll and then share the results with the network. So we have 85% of the network that thinks C is the correct answer. Childhood TB diagnosis requires a bit more effort. And uh, we had a few that thought none of the above was the correct answer. And then the rest were split between option A and B. Right, Dr. Zimba. All right, thank you. Uh, network, don't worry, Dr. Singin is just uh, pulling a, a fast one on you. You can't see who's pulling on this end. <laughs> Please feel free to, 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 to pick the answer that you think is the best answer of choice. So 
like uh, we can now go into the meat of the didactic. So tuberculosis is one of the top 10 causes of morbidity and mortality worldwide. I think it ranks above uh, HIV and AIDS. So it's, I think, COVID now that has just surpassed it and it's now uh, uh, just below COVID. Otherwise, uh, TB is a big burden. And uh, this disease commonly affects the lungs, uh, but can virtually affect any part of the body. Um, and then when it affects any other part of the body other than the lungs, we call it a supermonary TB. And uh, what you should note is about 10 million people get infected with TB every year. Um, it's not that these 10 million people will go and develop the active disease, but they do get infected and about a third of these will develop the active disease of uh, TB. So you will notice as we go on the importance of differentiating uh, those that get infected and those that have actual disease in helping prevent or stopping TB by 2035 in, in relation with the TB preventive uh, therapy. Uh, you should also note uh, that the TB is a curable disease and very preventable. So most of this information I've said is there in our 2022 WHO Consolidated Guidelines on Tuberculosis. Um, so TB is a major concern, uh, a cause of morbidity and mortality among children, especially those under the age of five. We will notice that TB in children below the age of five is fast progressing and uh, tends to affect them. So like I said earlier on about almost 10 million people get infected with, with TB every year. Uh, we had about 1.5 million deaths from TB uh, arising, and of these deaths, 226,000 of them were children between zero and uh, 14. Um, we see that that number is quite high, and this, most of these deaths is actually preventable. So we see that again, uh, about 47.5% of children less than five years were at high risk of developing uh, TB in this age group. When we come to see this, there are about 80% of those children that died, when you took off these 226,000 deaths that occurred in 2020, 80% in children, 80% of these were below the age group of five. In the next few slides, you will see where the gap is in making a diagnosis of TB, especially for children below the age of uh, five. Then again, we see that 96% of these deaths, children did not access TB treatment. So either the diagnosis of TB was not made at the facility or they got missed and didn't access the treatment and nine percent of these deaths were children living with HIV. So we see here that HIV is a contributor, but um, for Zambia, I think we have made some big improvements in reducing the morbidity uh, of TB in the HIV infected uh, group, from reducing it from around sixty percent to less than forty percent of our TB cases being uh, HIV related. So this slide that we're now looking at looks at our case detection gap. Um, and prevention that we have. So when we come to our case detection gap, we see that uh, between zero and four years, 72%, which is almost 73% of these children were missed who have TB in 2020 and went on to proceed with, with, with active disease. And then um, we can see that the highest gap where we are missing these children with TB is between the age group of zero to four. So what you should know on network is that yes, when we say TB notification should be 10% or 11% of adult, majority of those should be below the age of five. So we are now almost getting a one-to-one -one ratio in terms of notifications as Zambia, but that shows a gap in us missing a lot of children below the age of five being picked up for, uh, with TB. So we see that only about less than 30% below the age of five were picked up, which is quite a big, big gap. Then when we come to preventive therapy, um, in 2020, almost two thirds of the 1.1 children who were eligible for TPT did not access TB preventive therapy. This is another gap that we have. We see that uh, especially in our HIV negative children who are exposed to TB contacts or household contacts, very few are actually given uh, the TPT that they need to, rec to receive. So we are then getting a gap and therefore these children end up proceeding and developing uh, active uh, disease. Okay, so we can look at this. So I'd like to say that um, COVID has been with us now, I think almost uh, three years or so, and COVID has had a big impact on our health systems. Um, this is what the impact has been globally on the TB. So I think uh, some scholars are suggesting that COVID 
has set us back 10 years backwards on the global picture in terms of uh, the successes we had made towards TB. So the global picture, we're seeing that for children between zero and four, the number of children notified reduced by about 28%. And you see that this is the age group that was hit the most. Despite I saying COVID doesn't affect uh, children as much as it affects the adults, we are seeing this impact. 28% of notif notifications went down globally. 21% for the age group between five and uh, 14, and above 15, only 18%. Again, I'm saying only just because I'm comparing with children, but it's a big gap that we, we dropped in notifications by 18% globally. Um, Zambia has done quite well. I'll, I'll tell you that Zambia is among the few countries that have actually sustained or even increased the number of notifications. And I think this has been due to several interventions that have been put in place. Uh, those of us that know the MT45 and the MT55 campaigns that have been done in this period, they've helped us meet this gap uh, and sustain the gains that we had made. So let's just now come back and look at what we have uh, at the local level. I know I've spoken too much. I think we'll have a poor question in the next slide. Um, the burden of TB. TB is a major public health concern in Zambia, especially for children. And Zambia is ranked among the top 30 high burden uh, TB, HIV burden countries. I think we should be number 13. And uh, of note is that we're estimated to have about 59,000, close to 60,000 TB cases every year. For the last two years, I think we've made progress in notifying over 40,000 TB cases. But prior to that, we're notifying less than 40,000 TB cases. And this has been because of the matching towards 45,000 TB cases, which was abbreviated to MT45 campaign, and the MT55, which is matching towards 55,000 campaign that was done throughout the year in trying to achieve these uh, cases. In both uh, MT45 and MT55, I think we made 40,000 and over 50,000 TB notifications annually, which was a great success. And most of this goes out to you, the people on the network, for your hard work. You've actually uh, made a lot of uh, strides and worked harder for us to achieve these goals and thumbs up to you. So we come to TB, the TB burden in Zambia is estimated or globally around 11% of the notifications that you make. So for instance, if we are notifying 50,000 cases, 11% of those should be children. If we're notifying 100,000, we're saying 11,000 should be children. But however, we normally don't meet that as a country. We are only notifying around 6 to 8% of these TB, uh, children with TB being notified. This means that we are missing around 3 to 5% of these children going undetected. What that means is that these children end up going and uh, either dying in the community or coming in with complications for those who are above the age of six or seven who are able to cough out, end up even infecting other children or even other people in the community with TB. So again, I'd like to highlight some of the gains that we've made in childhood TB. I think this slide makes me happy as well because I think from 2018, we can actually see uh, that we are notifications are steadily increasing for TB. I think we've seen a 29% increase between 20 and 21% uh, compared to a 10% increase in the previous years, which shows that our work uh, together with you people in the facilities, in the communities, is yielding results. We have improved our notifications from 2,200 to about 3,900, just shy of 4,000 cases. Despite that, we're also seeing, let me, so let me say despite, even the other positive is that we're seeing a correlation between the uh, bacteriologically confirmed cases going up and the clinically confirmed cases. What this tells us, it means that our diagnoses are right. We're not making false diagnoses because even the confirmed cases are also going up. So thumbs up to you. And this, I think, should be rewarding, and you must be happy about it, that we're making some success somewhere. So I think I've spoke for some time. We can have an, our next poll question. Right. So the next poll question says, uh, childhood TB differs from adult TB in the following ways. I'll repeat that. Childhood TB differs from adult TB in the following ways. A, usually, primary infection and slow in progression. B, four symptom check is more reliable in adults than children. C, same drugs used at the same dosage. D, children have high bacterial load. I'll go over the question once more. Childhood TB differs from adult TB in the following ways. A, usually primary infection and, in, and slow in progression. B, 
Four symptom check is more reliable in adults than children. C, same drugs used at the same dosage. And D, children have a high bacterial load. So Janet, those are the options for the second poll question. It's a very interesting question, I must admit, Dr. Zimba. And um, probably there's some English also to consider in the question. I encourage the entire network to participate. Right now we are at just 45% or so of the network have participated. Just a few more people to, to participate so that we get a better understanding of um, what the network thinks is the correct answer. Right. So it's a very interesting voting pattern where we have seen that 67% um, of the network thought B was the correct answer. And then we had 16% that thought A, primary, uh, usually primary infection and slowing progression was the correct answer. And then the rest were split between C and D. So I'll throw it back to Dr. Zimba to, to help us clarify what the correct answers will be in the next few slides. All right, thank you. So we can proceed, we'll stop sharing the poll. Okay, so I think the results have been shared. We can proceed with the presentation. Okay, so I thought of picking this uh, table, this tree and putting it into this presentation for today. Those of us that have seen the WHO 2022 update guidelines, this has this tree appearing in it um, in the, in, 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 on the pages when we're trying to look at each intervention. So basically what this tells us is that you have this child who's in the middle and exposed right at the beginning, is exposed to this uh, group that once somebody has, uh, T, uh, has TB. When this child gets exposed, this child gets infected and he's not symptomatic there. If he accesses the healthcare system, he'll take the route that goes below there, gets preventive therapy, and doesn't get to have active TB treatment. If he doesn't go to the health facility, or unfortunately he goes to the health facility and nobody thinks of giving him TPT, like the gap was highlighted in our first presentation, he will go on to get the TB disease, which is get infected and have, he's already infected, have symptoms, he will fall ill. If he accesses the healthcare system and somebody makes a diagnosis of TB, he will receive treatment and get back to being fine. If he doesn't, unfortunately, he will get missed or undiagnosed and end up either as a mortality or with complications. I think this is quietly seen so, so severely in our 2022 WHO guidelines that were there. So one of the objectives that we had at the beginning of this presentation was that we need to differentiate between childhood and adult with TB. And I think the last poll question also had some similar things that we need to pick uh, to in helping address this. So what you need to remember is that TB in children is commonly a reflection of TB in adults. So if you are seeing a lot of TB in children in your community, it tells you that there are a lot of adults that have TB there. Similarly, if you are seeing a lot of adults with TB, it tells you that there are a lot of children in the community that have TB. We can't go to a place where we are sputum positive adults and have no child in our register. It means we are missing TB. So TB in children is commonly a primary infection. And like in adults where it's a secondary infection where somebody had the TB and then it's now getting reactivated because the immune system has either been compromised or there's something that is triggering that to develop. So similarly, again, we see that TB in children is usually fast progressing compared to adult where it's a, it's a disease of slow progression and may appear after several years that, that, that it has happened. So like I've said, TB in children is really a reflection of TB cases in the community. In children, we use the same drugs as those that are used in adults, but at slightly higher doses. So I think if you remember that MCQ that was there, it was taking about drugs being used, using the same four drugs at a similar dose. But what we're saying is that we use them at a higher dose. And then TB preventive therapy helps work in both age groups and children really need the TB preventive therapy because the disease progresses faster in them. So please consider children receiving TPT all the time. And then the four symptom checklist, remember that even when we're in our ART clinics in there, we normally ask the four symptom checklist, cough, weight loss, fever, night sweats. 
This is quite common in adults. In children, it will not be that reliable. You may find that reduced playness, playfulness, failure to thrive are more common than just the night sweats that are going to present in there. So I think this was what was one of, one of the answers in there. So I've spoken for a few minutes this time around. We can have the next poll question. Thank you so much, Dr. Zimba. Um, very interesting information coming up um, in, in the presentation so far. So the next four question says, a two-year-old child with a cough and fever for two weeks is brought to your brother, sorry, let me repeat that. A two-year-old child with cough and fever for two weeks is brought to your clinic which of the following information is helpful in establishing a diagnosis of TB? It's a single choice answer. Part A says static growth at, on under five card in the last three months. Um, the the poor question is, is cut, right. Okay, so static growth on under five card in three months, in the, three, in the last three months and was treated for malnutrition four months ago. B. The child is breastfeeding from an HIV-infected mother on ART, or rather highly active antiretroviral therapy, for three years. C, the father died from TB three years ago. And D, none of the above. I'll repeat the question. A two-year-old child with cough and fever for two weeks is brought to your clinic. Which of the following information is helpful in establishing a diagnosis of TB? A, static growth on under five cards in the last three months and was treated for malnutrition four months ago. B, a child is breastfeeding from an HIV-infected mother on heart for three years. C, a father died from TB three years ago. And D, none of the above. Right, so we are, we are getting an almost landslide uh, weighing on one option, but we are seeing uh, a steady increase on one of the other options. So dear network, um, I'll just give it a few more seconds to allow more participants to participate in, the, in, the, in this poll. And then we'll end it and share the results and hand it over to, to Dr. Zimba to, to highlight uh, uh, childhood TB with respect to this poll question. Right, so I'll end the poll now and share the results. So we had 75% that went for option A as the correct answer. And then we had 17% that thought C was the correct answer. And 5% thought none of the above was the correct answer. And the remainder thought B was the correct answer. I'll throw it back to Dr. Zimba to take us through. Thank you, Dr. Singimi. Sorry, um, okay. So very interesting poll question that, that, that was there. So I hope by the, by the end of this next few slides would have gotten the answer to that poll question. So what is important in making a diagnosis of TB in children is just basically following a structured approach, which starts with a good history, physical examination, investigations, and, uh, and then tying one and two uh, together. So we see that uh, you can make a probable diagnosis if you're in the presence of three or more of the following. Say in a child who has symptoms suggestive of TB on the clinical history that you can get from history, there's usually a cough, fever, weight loss, night sweats, and reduced full playfulness. Um, you note that there's also a history of a contact for TB. What is regarded as contact is somebody being in contact with uh, a TB person in the last two years, especially that TB progresses within two years and in 10% of these children who are in contact to either get TB, active TB disease or not. You will note in our poor question, it was a two-year-old child whose father had TB three years ago. Three years ago. The, this child was not yet even born then. And it's a common mistake when we're getting our history in the facilities where somebody could come to a TB and then says, Bambi Yaki was in a TB. Bambi Yaki was in 1990 something and yet this child was born now, so it's a common mistake, and that's why that poor question was put in place for us to try and uh, identify that uh, age that is important for us to know that is at least two years is considered significant contact. Then, when we come to physical exam, we we'll, we'll see that the wasting, uh, lose, uh, failing to thrive, lymphadenopathy, signs of a may be there, or other non-specific uh, 
features that we can find in these uh, patients who have uh, TB. And that's why we had put a child who's not gaining weight, uh, has been going several times to the under five clinic or MCH clinic, has not, has not been gaining weight and nobody's thinking of picking TB. So let's make sure that we look at the under five card and look for issues of weight gain and weight loss that are there. Where we have a chest X-ray, remember that in children, chest X-rays may not have the typical cavitatory signs that we find in uh, adults, but they may just be an opacity, a pro effusion, sometimes even just uh, you, 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 you immediately picture, which shows that a, a severe form that would be there. In rare instances, if we are able to have access to a tuberculin skin test or IGRA and tying one and all, the, all these things together, then we'll be able to pick and say this child could have TB or a probable diagnosis of TB. So in order for us to confirm a diagnosis of TB, you need results that help you confirm that. So, uh, which is the gene expert. So I'll say for gene expert, we've extended the spectrum of samples that can be taken for gene expert, which now includes two in Zambia. So we should be able to take two for gene expert and make a good diagnosis. A positive two gene expert tells you a respiratory a sign of respiratory TB. So it's considered as pulmonary TB in most of the times when we have a positive two gene expert. Like any other sample for gene expert, I think the why I'm emphasizing on stool is that it's a commonly asked question is how do we follow up the two patients? So similarly, like any other child, we don't use gene expert for follow-up unless we're expecting that there's failure or we're trying to look for RR resistance. So gene expert is just an initial test. So you're not going to send this stool for repeat gene expert at month two or microscopy for, for um, AFB. Then we also have smear microscopy, which is still used for follow-up for those who are smear positive. And then we have cultures that we can do. Urine lamb is one of those that can be done. And then another question that commonly comes on urine lamb is whether urine lamb confirms TB or not. So urine lamb is a confirmatory test. So if you find a positive urine lamb, it tells you that patient is excreting components or some structures that are being produced by the cell wall of the bacilli. And therefore it's confirmatory that this patient has a positive uh, as, as TB. And then also have TB lamb that is there. And so similar even for urine lamb, we won't use urine lamb as a follow-up test. Urine lamb doesn't tell us that this is drug resistant or drug susceptible TB. The downside advantage of urine lamb is it also doesn't differentiate whether it's microbacterium, tuberculosis, or any other form of, uh, or, or mort that is there microbacteria rather than tuberculosis that we're diagnosing. And we should try and avoid contamination by collecting a cream catch uh, urine when doing that. So here is just another way of trying to look at what I've just said in the last uh, minute or so, in that making a diagnosis of TB in children is not difficult. It's just required the structured approach and putting things together. So we've seen this jigsaw puzzle, I'm sure our children like playing with this jigsaw puzzle. So we start with signs and symptoms, so somebody has cough, fever, weight loss, night sweats, reduced playfulness, that may be there. The next is TB exposure. Was there a contact with TB in the last two years, not three years, or somebody who died several years ago? Is a tuberculin skin test available or IGRA available for you to confirm the presence of infection? If you had a facility that can do uh, confirmatory tests, are we able to do a gene expert? Are we able to do a smear microscopy? Are we able to do a microbacterium culture, a urine lamb or a TB lamb? to be done. Then lastly, we can look at abnormal chest x-rays. So when we have radiological changes that are suspicious of TB on the x-ray, we say, wow, this could be TB and put everything together. Remember that children don't have high loads of bacilli compared to adults. So I always tell people that medicine is just getting uh, simple terms and making them complicated. We'll say TB in children is palsy bacilli. That word palsy bacilli just means there's few bacilli. In short, so children don't have a high bacterial load compared to adults. So it, sometimes you find that your confirmatory test may be negative. It doesn't throw out that they don't have TB. And TB in children may sometimes may present not the typical presentation or maybe in a typical presentation. It's not common to see somebody who has TB presenting with acute severe pneumonia or respiratory distress. You will see a TB patient with a very bad chest X-ray, even at the bad drinking. But for children, you may find that sometimes they present with a, an atypical presentation where they have acute severe pneumonia uh, features and it's very distress and everything like that, and it could be TB. Sometimes they just fear to respond to appropriate antibiotics, or they could be wheezing because of obstruction of a lymph node on, on the 
On the other side, the typical presentation, we've talked about the cough, weight loss, fever, fatigue, reduced play, play, playfulness, plus minus night sweats, which are more common in children above the age of 10 years. This, I think most of us should have seen this several times now. And here, we're just trying to highlight how easy it is to make a diagnosis of TB if you just follow a structured approach. For instance, here is this child who's HIV negative. This child has come in with those symptoms that we think this child has TB. If the expert is positive, automatically the TB is present. If this child comes in and expert is negative or we're not able to do expert, has this child been in contact with somebody with TB? Are there signs suggestive of TB? Is there cough, weight loss, fever, reduced playfulness and night sweats? Is there a chest actually suggestive of making a diagnosis of TB? If we have two or more of these, treat this child as having TB. If this, uh, maybe you only have one, reassess this child, review in the next two to four weeks and make a probable, another diagnosis. Notice that there are children who are HIV infected as well. And their algorithm is slightly similar, but this time around, it's very easy to make a diagnosis. A child who's got HIV has uh, a smear positive or expert that is positive or urine lamb that is positive, automatically treat this child for TB. But this child has features of suggestive of TB, weight loss, night sweats, has been coughing, reduced playfulness, and there's a contact, just start treating this child for TB. It's better and, 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 and that way. If this child has a chest sex suggestive of TB, is HIV negative, HIV positive, start this child on TB treatment, you will save a life. So here, I was just trying to compare the two things so that we actually see the difference. On the HIV negative, there's emphasis of having two or more uh, features to help you make a diagnosis. On the HIV, this side, we're just basically looking for one sign and there then consider having this child to have a diagnosis of TB. I know I've spoken for some time, but I think we need to know why we are treating these children. So what are the aims of treating for TB? So our aim is to cure this child. When this child comes with TB, we want this child to get cured. And most of the time we get so worried about uh, treatment success. Remember that in children, sometimes we won't get the cure rate of having to have, a, to have a, uh, a smear negative at the end of treatment. There is no need for that for children who are below the age of six who can't cough out. There's no need to repeat a gastric lavage. We'll discuss that as we are going on. We need to prevent complications, prevent relapses, prevent the development of acquired drug resistance. Let's make sure our children are, to, are being uh, given the medication at the right time. There's uh, adherence and all those so that we don't have acquired drug resistance. We need to prevent transmission to others. I think these are the five aims of treatment for of TB in children. They are similar to those that are in adults. And by now, we should all know that uh, ethambito is indicated. That means it can be given in children. Um, a few years ago, if you were learning, you were told ethambito can be given in children. But now we are saying ethambito should be given to all the children that have TB, especially in our settings. So they will receive all the four drugs but at a slightly higher dose for rifampicin and isoniazide in children. And then for continuation phase, they'll receive the two drugs, rifampicin and isoniazide for four months. If this child has extra um, or severe forms of uh, TB, not, ex MEP, not extra pulmonary, severe forms of TB, such as TB meningitis, TB of the bone, TB spine, miliary TB, this child should receive treatment for one year, which is 10 months of continuation phase. You will see this child on the right side on the picture drinking happy release drugs. What we are trying to highlight here is that I think from 2016, Zambia was, I think, the second country in the region in Africa to introduce the, the test, the palatable tests, and easy to give uh, pediatric friendly drugs, which is easy to dissolve in water. Just about 10, 30 mils of water, they will dissolve easily and you give it. I know the HSA says 50 mils, but imagine you're giving 50 mils to a small baby, it's quite a lot of water. But I think 30 mils is very much. Uh, uh, you can give it. I was really hoping we'll get a poor question now, but let's go ahead and look at TB and uh, HIV. I hope I'm not boring the network and you're following. So TB and HIV, like we see HIV in adults, there's, there are also children that have HIV and the case definitions don't differ as that of adults or, the, 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 or that of children or those that are living with HIV and negative, there's no difference. 
But what we need to note is that TB takes priority. So if we see a child who's got HIV today and we have diagnosed them with TB at the same time, we'll start this child on a TB treatment and try and reinitiate initiate ART within two to three weeks of starting treatment if they are pulmonary TB. For TB meningitis, it's recommended that we wait even as long as eight weeks before starting the ART. So all children with TB HIV uh, co-infection should receive cotrimoxazole or prophylaxis and, and ART. Of note is that most of our children who are living with HIV are malnourished and therefore need to be supported you know, for nutritional support. So TB HIV infected children need a nutritional support for us to get better outcomes for both TB and the HIV itself. Here is the important aspect. All family members should be counseled and screened for both HIV and TB. So contact tracing should actually be our major source of our TB cases in children. I think those of us that are familiar with the HIV program, we talk of indexing being our major case of our HIV positive uh, uh, clients. Contact tracing here is very much encouraged. So in children, it's, got, it's called reverse contact tracing. When you find a child with TB, go backwards and find where the index case is, that is in the adult who had the actual TB and transmitted to this child and there. So screen them. And when you're doing the contact tracing, it's a gateway to having our member, family members tested for HIV and put on treatment or, or preventive measure services. So some challenges that we expect to anticipate when you're dealing with uh, TB HIV co-infection is that we would have a drug-to-drug -drug interaction. Remember DTG, which is our preferred choice of treatment, has some interactions with our, our TB treatment. So we need to double, uh, that is give a, a BD dose of DTG. Also not the pill burden because now we're increasing the number of uh, pills that this child would have to take. Uh, also, also that there are common side effects for these drugs, the TB treatment and the antiviral drugs that we'll be giving. So this may complicate management. Hence us saying, wait before starting the ART for one to two, three weeks, for two to three weeks for pulmonary and eight weeks for extrapulmonary uh, TB. So poor response to TB may be as a result of a wrong diagnosis or multiple or concurrent opportunistic infections that are happening. So what I'm trying to say here is that, yes, you've made a diagnosis of uh, TB, but always look out for other possible causes of illness, especially in our children living with HIV. And, and I'm sure we've all heard of iris. So iris is just a masking of active TB disease. So sometimes we may have missed the diagnosis of TB at the time we're screening or initiating this patient on TB treatment. And within three weeks to about six months of starting ART, this child comes back manifesting with TB symptoms. So basically just unmasking this TB that was there but was missed during that. Okay, so we can quickly have our poll question number four. I hope people are not dozing on the call. Kabwe, are we okay? Right. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Zimba. Very insightful presentation so far. And um, we, we, we will launch our fourth poll. Um, I'll just ask IT to help me launch it. I'm struggling on this end. Um, as also, as we wrap up uh, the, the presentation so that we can get into the discussions by somewhere 15, 20. Right, so the, 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 the poll, question, uh, poll question number four says, TB in children, choose a single best answer. A repeat gene expert is required for routine follow-up. B, a repeat chest x-ray is usually not required at two months of treatment. But C, repeat gastric lavage is required if symptoms have improved. And the last one is adherence should not be reinforced during review visits. So that is a very straightforward question. Choose the single best answer. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll be ending the poll in just a few seconds. Uh, just allow one more person to, to poll. Right, so the network, in the interest of time, I will quickly end this poll and uh, share the results. So the majority of the participants uh, think B is the correct answer, which says a repeat chest X-ray is not required at month two uh, of treatment. So I'll throw it back to Dr. Zimba to run us through the, the remaining slides. Okay, so thank you. So. We've come to the point where we are looking at monitoring uh, treatment response. 
So what we are saying is that at every visit, please do weigh these children and adjust the dose when the child exceeds the various weight bands. We've seen in practice where we've had children who've changed weight bands and are still receiving the same dosage as they started with. When we are doing that as healthcare workers, we are contributing to the development of drug-resistant TB. Secondly, we're saying follow-up smear exams should only be done for children who are able to cough. Do not do gastric lavages to repeat that. We will not do uh, repeat follow-up chest x-rays at month two and month six. Um, we, will, they, we will not use a gene expert uh, to use uh, in, in, in making follow-up for our patients. So gene experts are for diagnosis, unless we want to think our patients are not improving and therefore we are going back to say, let's make sure that this child doesn't have RR uh, and then we use a gene expert that will be there. Then adherence should be reinforced at every visit that these patients come through. So I'm sure we've remembered the questions that we're coming through and I've tried to answer those poor questions that were there with this slide. So we'll quickly go, for, go forward. So what can cause our children not to improve? So non-adherence to treatment or we are underdosing these children. Treatment failure can be one of those that may be their ART treatment failure, or they have HIV co-infection, where is there PCP or any other infection that is there? Are these children malnourished? Could this be drug-resistant TB that we're dealing with? Was the diagnosis not correct that we made? Also, most of the time, our children that were starting, especially those that have uh, HIV, may be having diarrhea, and then there's mal malabsorption of the drug, so we end up with a malabsorption. So suboptimal calculations, please do calculate the drugs according to the weight bands. Is it drug to drug interaction of the ART causing this or could these patients have iris? We can quickly go to poor question number five and then I think we'll have the last set of presentations. Right, thank you so much, Dr. Zimba. The fifth poll says, which of the following is true about primary drug resistant TB in children? A, a child can develop Excuse me, a child can develop primary drug resistant TB due to poor adherence. B, a child whose mother has DRTB can acquire primary drug resistant TB. C, children cannot have drug resistant TB. And D, children who are contacts of DRTB patients cannot be given TPT. Very interesting question regarding DRTB in children, and would like to see what the network thinks regarding that, uh, that question. So right now we're just slightly below 20% of the network participating. Uh, we'll just give it a second or two so that we can quickly have the responses from Dr. Zimba. Right, so we have 55% uh, of the network that thinks, um, a is the correct answer, and then the rest thought the other options. So Dr. Zimba, over to you. Okay, so thank you. So like we said, I think one of our didactic, uh, one of the cases that we have today is a case of DRTB. So we will see that uh, most children who are drug resistant TB, actually it's primary drug resistance. What we mean by primary is that these children get infected with a drug resistant bug or mycobacteria that is drug resistant. And usually it's from a close contact that they are with. It's usually maybe their mother has drug resistant TB or their guardian or somebody in the house has drug resistant TB. Hence it being primary drug resistant TB. So when should you think that this person or child could have drug resistant TB? So we're saying when there's a close contact to have drug resistant TB, or there's a patient who's a close contact to have TB and died, or is not adherent to treatment, or failed TB treatment. There's previous history of TB treatment in the past six to 12 months, think that this child could have drug resistant TB. A child who's not improving after two to three months on first line TB treatment, including persistence of a positive smear, that's if you've repeated, a culture or persistence of system, sim, um, symptoms and failure to gain weight. So in a child who develops TB after or while on isoniazide prophylaxis, think that this child could have drug-resistant TB. So again, I'll repeat, most of the time in children is primary drug resistance. They inherit a drug that is already uh, resistant, unlike where they develop it because of poor adherence or under dosages that are there. 
In terms of TB treatment, we're saying consult your clinical expert committee. So I think we should have a clinical expert committee at provincial district or even national level. And what we are of note here is that WHO has now recommended uh, oral uh, treatment for MDR-TB. We're using bedaquilin for those less than six years and delaminate for those that are less than uh, three years. So, which is quite welcome, but I'm sure the formulations or pediatric formulations are yet to be in country. Over time, they will come through. So we'll quickly look at the last poll question. Willingness to prescribe TPT, true or false? Right. Are healthcare workers prescribing TPT? All right, so I'm having a little bit of a challenge launching the poll. Right, so there we have it, Network. Kindly pick the, the best answer, and um, let's, let's, let's see what the network thinks on this one. I'll just give it five more seconds, and then we'll ask Dr. Zimba to wrap up the didactic presentation. Right, so we have 89% of those that have polled thinking true is the correct answer. So Dr. Zimba, please uh, wrap it up for us. Okay, so indeed it's true. They, uh, most of the time, healthcare workers have a problem. They don't want to prescribe the TPT. So I'll quickly say uh, indications. What, what we're now saying is that all children under the age of five who are contacts of TB are eligible. We've now expanded the eligibility group to include even children and adolescents and adults who are the age, above the age of five to receive TPT if they have significant contact to a TB person, so long as you've excluded active TB disease. So contacts of MDR patients can now receive TPT. There are various options that are available. And uh, HIV-infected children whom active TB disease has been excluded should receive TPT above the age of one, provided they are not con uh, contacts. So we have uh, three current options that we're using, which is uh, isoniazide, uh, rifampicin, uh, and, uh, sorry, Rifapentin and INH weekly, which is commonly known as the 3HP, the high dose. And then uh, we have uh, the rifampicin isoniazide being available for the drug susceptible group. So the preferred choice for now for children living with HIV is isoniazide, which remains the preferred choice. But we know that for the people and adolescents and young people living with HIV, uh, 3HP is now the preferred uh, choice according to WHO guidelines in terms of us giving uh, TPT. So for MDR-TB, yes, TPT can be given. I'm sure we saw one of the questions that had come through on the poll questions that TPT is eligible. It can be given, but what we need to consider is the intensity of exposure, the drug resistance pattern that is there, confirm the bacterial susceptibility of, of the, the, the TB that this patient has, and confirm the presence of infection. But this should not be a hindrance. If we're not able to do TST or IGRA, provided we can do one of these things, we can give uh, TPT. And one of those recommended is if we for six months and other drugs that are available. I would like to highlight the last point, which is that follow up of these patients who are drug susceptible, drug resistant TB, whom we give TPT or have not given, so long as we think their contacts should be done for an entire two years. Don't just let them go and they go. So we need to follow them for the whole two years and make sure that they don't develop active TB disease. So in conclusion, I would like to say TB in children remains underdiagnosed with gaps in detection, diagnosis, treatment, and prevention. The use of TPT in children remains underutilized, and childhood TB requires a bit more effort and a structured approach to make a diagnosis, which I hope I've outlined here. And then I would like to say the cascade, of the, the cascade effect of the COVID pandemic is far from over but with preparation and response would be key. I think Zambia has demonstrated this by sustaining the number of notifications that we have. So COVID-19 remains a challenge and threat to all the gains that are being made in childhood TB. And I'd like to say health systems should now adopt to this as the new normal. I think these are my acknowledgements and thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Zimba, for, for taking us through the, 
the, the, the didactic presentation. Uh, I've noticed that uh, we have a number of questions that have been posted in the chat box. So what I am suggesting is for now, we move to the breakout rooms and possibly in the breakout room, some of those questions will be answered. And let's also take note of the questions that will remain pending and then we'll discuss them in the main room when we reconvene at 4.50, rather at 3.50 for the discussion and wrap up of today's session. So I'll invite IT to open up the breakout rooms and then we'll, we'll all join the respective breakout rooms. So as a reminder, Southern Province and Western Province, you're joining breakout room one and you'll be with Dr. Chelo Mwinga, uh, Dr. Chavala Chala and um, Dr. Zimba. And for room two, we'll have Eastern Province and Cent Eastern Province, Lusaka and Central Province. And this will have Dr. Kozia Ziambo and uh, Miss Mary Shizuka. Right, so Dear Network, we invite you to join the, the breakout rooms. They are now open. For the participants from the Northern region, uh, that's Copper Belt, Central, Mchinga, Luapula, Northern Province, you can join any of the two rooms. Right, thank you so much. Only one question in the chat.
So welcome back to the main hub, dear network. The time now is 15.52, and we would have to wrap up the, the session for the day. So we, we had quite some interesting cases of uh, childhood TB in both uh, rooms. Uh, Choma was discussing a case of uh, drug susceptible TB in a child. And on the, on the other side in group one, we were looking at a child who had drug resistant TB. I must say there were quite some interesting discussion points. So, but then in the interest of, uh, of the entire network, there was a question that was raised in group one regarding um, people or children that have been in contact with uh, DRTB patients. So I'll still throw back the question to Dr. Chavala to just echo the sentiments he gave in group one for the benefit of the entire network. Dr. Chavala. I was saying that um, for those children who are contacts of MDRT, I think Dr. Zimba already mentioned in, the, in his presentation that um, you could consider the option of giving a fluoroquinolone and in children usually the consideration is given to give the child levofloxacin for, for six months or high dose isonazid and there's also the option of delaminin. So it's very usually very important to have a susceptibility test of the index case because if the person who is the index case has fluoroquinone resistance, then you would then use the option. So then you wouldn't then want to use the option of of, of fluoroquinones unless they are fluoroquinone sensitive. And I must say that at the moment, this, sub, this is still a subject of a number of trials. I think there are three main trials that have been ongoing to kind of establish what is the appropriate uh, regimen for, for MDR TV contacts. But at the moment, what is used is a consensus um, that has been agreed by different experts that use either fluoroquinone, idocyanate, or the laminate as options. Right. Right. Thank you so much, Dr. Chavala, for speaking to that. And I've also seen there's a comment in the chat box from Marshall who's saying drug sensitivity testing profile is very important when providing TPT. Thanks for your comment, Marshall. And uh, there's also another comment coming in that it should be a case by case approach. Uh, thank you so much. Of course, that's guided by the clinical experts committee uh, resolutions like Dr. Chavala has uh, highlighted. And um, so please, whenever you encounter a case of uh, DRTB contact in children, consult the next or the high level uh, or rather the clinical experts committee, which are available. Each province has its own uh, so that help is given. Right. So at this point, allow me to just open up the discussion from all the participants. If you have any questions that may have arisen from your discussion groups, or something that you need a bit more clarity from the didactic presenter or the experts from the presentation, please just go ahead and um, ask a question. Right, Nathan Sinyango, I see your hand. Please unmute and give us a comment or question. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Asingini. Uh, so, we had a very good in, uh, case in the in, in, in the breakaway, uh, though I did not really have that opportunity to ask. But it also applies to even the didactic uh, presentation that Dr. Zimba made. It's uh, with regard to malnutrition in children. It came out in the in the in the presentation by Dr. Zimba, and uh, it also applied to the case we had in the room. The social history. Uh, for the child we had is not uh, very good. Uh, but the thanks that uh, the child uh, uh, also uh, has HIV. And as that, the child uh, was enrolled in the OVC program, which means they had access to any social support. My question was, uh, supposing that the child uh, was not HIV, they only had TB, uh, what level of social support could be there? Because we've noticed that uh, uh, the, 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 the social support that comes from Global Fund is strictly meant for those that are MDR. So regarding those children, I know in the HIV program, we have the OVC that is able to provide uh, any social support, but children that have got uh, TB just, 
uh, what level of support is there. My other question is, uh, I've not come across it, but I understand there's a secular, a memo that uh, we can now give uh, a TPT without TB6. I just, uh, I just, just heard, I'm yet to find this uh, memo. Does that apply to children, giving um, a TPT without uh, B6? Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Singin. Thank you so much, Nathan, for, for that question. So the first part, I'll ask uh, Dr. Zimba to speak to the nutritional support in children and uh, what intervention. I think there was also another question in the chat box speaking to that nutritional support available for children uh, with TB or uh, the vulnerable for children whose parents are suffering from TB. And then the next question on TPT uh, without B6, I think I'll throw this one to Dr. Chabala, uh, to, uh, or rather Dr. Dr. Mwinga to speak to TPT without B6. Okay, so thank you. So let me, let me, let me try and give it a shot. So the, we, when you look at these um, children who have TB and don't have HIV, they are still also vulnerable, especially to nutritional deficiencies, and and uh, and the like, and you've like as you as you've likely put it, those who have HIV at least as one arm that is being taken taking care of them through the through the OVC program. However, I would like to age members of the network to take advantage of these programs like the social cash transfer that is being given by government. I think to these people that that, 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 that are vulnerable, that we do encourage some of our clients to get onto that program. We also have other partners NGOs that are doing these things that you let. Zit Sasat and all those other NGOs that are there that we do get to involve them and they participate in the management of uh, these uh, patients. Um, like you've clearly said, I think during our interactions, I think last week, it's one thing that we noticed that we need to tap into all those people, all those NGOs, all those uh, facilities that are providing some kind of social support, economic support to these uh, uh, that they can be tapped and brought on board to provide the support for TB clients that need it. Yes, we have most of the support going to our drug-resistant uh, patients through the Global Fund, but the other uh, clients are not getting the support that is needed. So coming to TPT, so it's um, a recommendation by WHO and, other that, and Zambia has adopted that we give everyone the isonazide regardless of whether they, have, uh, they need the B6 or not. One, for ease of guidelines has to give. Two, we are saying that most of our patients may have these in nutrient deficiencies or so. However, when you look at literature, it tells you that children are slow oscillators and, uh, and, and will not necessarily need the B6. I think in the, in the SHINE trial, we gave all our patients isonazide and we didn't report into a, to come back with the, with the neuro, peripheral neuropathy that is a common feature that is there, and therefore it is quite safe. But for Zambia, we've adopted that we'll give B6 to all clients that are receiving INH. Any comments on the Chavala before we get to? Yeah, um, so yeah, I think it, like you rightly pointed out that um, isonazid related neuropathy is not very common in children. So therefore, the priority if you need to give B6 is, is um, usually we should say if the child is malnourished or if the child is HIV infected, then those are prioritized um, to receive the preventive therapy. If, if, if for example, you don't have uh, um, an, uh, a B6 and you're trying to prioritize who to give, I think those are the ones that would be susceptible to neuropathy. But otherwise, in general, children are generally not susceptible to INH-related neuropathy. And therefore, shouldn't be a hindrance for, to the provision of uh, preventive therapy in kids. All right, thank you, Dr. Chabala. Dr. Zimba, maybe you could wrap up this uh, the topic for the day. All right, so I think, thank Sorry, you very Dr. much. Zimba, before you go, there was a, somebody asked a question about uh, how long you can put, you can keep a stool sample for expert testing. I don't know, but I think it came out much earlier on. So, so if, if you look at the, the current um, guidance that was published by the WHO and in relation to the, with the GLI, Global Laboratory something, something. So the, what they are saying is that uh, you can give a stool sample for three days at room temperature. 
and and then um, and, and 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 once it gets to, to to the lab, then it should be tested immediately. And they also actually give a provision that if you put it in an ordinary fridge between two to eight degrees, you can actually test it up to seven days. So that's that's the current that's in the guidance that's provided by the and the GLI. Okay, so thank you, Dr. Chavara. And I think, um, Network, you agree with me that I think the presentation, the, the topic of the day was quite big, and the, the two hour, one hour, 30 minutes we've had has been quite difficult to summarize the entire topic of childhood TB. But our take-home message is that childhood TB is not difficult to diagnose. It just requires a structured approach. And remember that we have a lot of children that are being missed out and not being diagnosed with TB. And if they are not diagnosed with TB or don't have TB, there are very few children being put on TB preventive therapy, especially for the HIV negative uh, uh, children. For the HIV, uh, children living with HIV, we've done quite well in increasing the TPT coverage in that age group, uh, in the pediatric age group. And then um, DRTB is uh, also possible in children and commonly the index case is an adult and therefore the susceptibility pattern is similar to that of an adult. And then lastly, remember that COVID is real and COVID has really affected the global pattern of uh, TB. And luckily for Zambia, we've been able to sustain our gains. And with that said, I think uh, that's all from my end. Dr. Sindini, over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Zimba. Just want to appreciate you for that uh, nice presentation. Also like to thank the, the, the subject matter experts that joined us on the call today, Dr. Chelo Mwinga, uh, very instrumental in breakout room two, uh, Dr. Chavala, uh, Ms. Mary Chizuka, uh, Dr. Linus Mwinga, thank you so much for, for your valuable contributions. Also don't neglect to thank the ECHO coordinator and uh, the IT that have coordinated this session. It's been a great session and looking forward to the next one. This is Dr. Singini from CIDES. We are signing out. Thank you.